Okay, let's get started. Okay, so at this point, you know what to do with the sequencing data. You know how to pull it down to counts per feature, and we are ready to do some differential expression analysis. So that's what I'm going to talk about now. And um, basically, the situation is this. If you don't care about what's sort of under the hood of the software, it's a lot like Lima. Um, there's a couple of little differences in terms of what you need to do for quality checking and stuff like that. But after that, it's pretty straightforward. So we're going to talk a little bit about what you need to do before the analysis. We're going to talk about the stats, and then um, we'll do the analysis. But most of the analysis we'll do in the lab. So of course, you have started by mapping your reads. And we want to. Uh, reduce them to counts per feature. I know uh, some of the software reduces things to RPKM or FPKM, um, but the statistical analysis requires counts, and that's to get an accurate estimate of the standard deviation. Okay, so yes? Well, you can plug anything in anywhere, but you'll have problems. You won't have the right standard deviation, so your false discovery and non discovery rates won't be quite right. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, that issue. Basically, if the counts, if you have all the high expressing genes, will be fine. It's the low ones that will cause you trouble at that point. Okay. Um, you know, some people kind of worry about the fact that longer genes, you expect to get more reads at the same expression level. But since we're always in these analyses, comparing the same feature across samples, not different features in the same sample, uh, we don't need to worry about that. If you need to compare features in the same sample, yes, you probably do want to use RPKM, but then you may not want to do, at this point, a formal statistical test. Okay. So as before, we'll have an expression matrix that's where the rows are the features and the columns are the samples. Oops. Yes. Well, oh, you mean the, the library size? Yeah, yeah. we're going to talk about that. Uh, basically, it's um, what's called an offset, and you'll see the offset uh, when I get to the stats part. OK, where was I? OK, so we had the expression matrix. Um, in the old days, to get enough reads, we sometimes ran multiple lanes for the same sample. You're probably not going to do that these days unless you're looking at uh, very small regions of the uh, transcriptome. Um, but in reality, what we're going to do these days is we're going to have multiplex samples, and they need to be split into individual samples. Um, and you might want to retain the lane information to make sure that there are no lane batch effects. Um, OK. So the stats background is this. Of course, we're working with counts now. Uh, that's why we don't want to use RPKM, because we need counts. Uh, we assume that in the I sample, pi ij of the reads come from uh, feature j. And I bet because the number of subscripts you end up in, in the notation gets messy, I've been a little sloppy about how many subscripts I'm using. But anyway. Sample I, feature J. And what we want to know is whether or not this percentage depends on the treatment. Remember, treatment could be genotype or treatment versus control, but treatments. So we're going to do the equivalent of t-tests or ANOVA tests, but we're going to take into account that the data are counts. And count data has three sources of variability. Uh, Poisson variability, which comes from the fact that you have this huge pool of stuff, um, and some percentage of it is gene, uh, gene I, and you start pulling things out, and the only ones you're interested in are gene, gene I, um, there's variability. If you, did it as, uh, if you sampled again from exactly the same pool of, of mRNAs, 
you would get a diff slightly different count, um, and that's Poisson variability. You also have biological variability due to the fact that when I take a sample from one, one biological entity or another, even if they're on the same treatment, the two pools will have different percentages, slightly different percentages, hopefully, of um, the particular transcript of interest, and then the systematic effects that are due to the treatment. Okay. So uh, the Poisson variability is basically due to the fact that as you sample, you either do or don't grab that tag. Uh, the biological variability is due to sample, to sample differences, and it's sometimes called the extra Poisson variability. Um, in a few bizarre kinds of studies, you can have smaller variability than you expect, uh, but it's still called extra, meaning outside of, not meaning additional. Okay, extra Poisson variability. And then the systematic effects, which is what we're really interested in. Question. Yes? Okay, so it turns out that Poisson variability, and I can't remember whether I have this. Yes, I do have it on the slide, but I'll just say it. Um, so if, if, if the percentage of reads of this type in the sample is pi ij, and if you grab ni reads, this is what you expect to get, right? And something that has Poisson with this expectation, the variance is the same as the expectation. And so what that means is that the standard deviation is the square root, right? And then people often look at um, like the relative size of these. And so what happens is relative to the expected number, uh, the variability goes down as a relative measure, but it does grow with the number of, with the, with the sample size. Sorry, with the sequencing depth. So it's really interesting that there's a much more optimal number of reads. No, more is always better. More is always better, except that you have to deal with the whole data stream. So what I've been told is, uh, more isn't always better because the mappers don't like more. So, for example, if you have uh, some short transcripts, then the mapper will say, you know, oh, all of a sudden we have a pileup. Remember we talked about the clonal stuff? Oh, we're going to throw those out. They're clones. Oh, we're going to throw it out because it's repetitive region. So there is a sweet spot, but it doesn't have to do with the differential expression analysis. It has to do with the mapping and how you, you set up uh, the the mapper routines to deal with uh, high coverage. So from the point of view of the differential expression analysis, more is always better. Um, but here's the other thing. What kind, when, when we're trying to get a replicable study, if you repeat the study, you're not going to have the same samples. You're going to have different biological reps, right? So this is the variance, this is the rep, this is the variability we want to capture. Um, so for a fixed amount of money, you got to decide the depth of each sample versus how many samples, right? It's usually, there is an optimal um, ratio of that, but that optimal ratio varies from G, from gene to gene, basically, because they come in different, uh, because they have different expression levels. Uh, but, well, that computation can be done, and if somebody wants to see the computation, um, I'll be happy to do it during the lab on the board. Okay. So, the goal of the differential expression analysis is to uh, capture the systematic effects. Um, it's usually measured in standard deviations, and you have to take into account both the technical and biological variation, just as in microarray studies. Um, 
but even with t perfect technical replicability, you still have Poisson variation to deal with. So I'm going to talk a little bit about models, uh, how you deal with the very low counts, um, which basically is you just, if, if you don't have enough sequence for a feature, you just can't do a differential expression analysis. Um, we'll look at some graphical stuff, which you probably already did. Uh, data prep, normalization, um, and then the actual models. Okay. So NI is the number of mapped reads in the sample. Pi IJ is the percentage of the, of the reads for feature J in sample I. Um, and like I said, if for a particular sample, uh, as long as the percentage is small, you should be getting Poisson variation. Um, people, you know, in the days when we split samples across lanes, you could see that they pretty much follow the Poisson. Um, but pi ij itself is not constant. Um, so the negative binomial distribution is used instead of the Poisson. And basically what that means is sort of the naive um, analyses that people were doing early on was to say, okay, I have a bunch of different samples and they all have counts and different library sizes. I'm just going to add across my samples. And that's okay for Poisson variation, but it's not okay for negative binomial variation. Okay? Um, so we're going to use this negative binomial distribution. Um, and so we're going to assume that the mean percentage of reads for feature J over all the biological replicates is uh, pi J. Okay? So actually pi J is also depends on the treatment, right? But there were too many subscripts, so I took it out. And then what we find um, if, is if you, you get this instead of the pi ij, that's the kind of, the idea is you pick a subject at random and you get ni observations from that subject, but you don't keep, kind of keep track of them. Um, so the mean over that, the expected number of reads is this, and the variance is this, and if this thing phi here, which is called the dispersion, is zero, then the mean and the variance are the same and you have Poisson uh, data, which is much easier to deal with. Um, and if not, there's uh, this extra Poisson variation which you have to estimate. I mean variance. <laughs> Okay. So the way it works is like this. So here's an individual sample with its own pi ij, and if you got exactly n reads out of that sample, um, if you know if you could somehow repeat that process, the reads would fall in these little boxes. And now we're not going to keep track of the sample. So what happens is uh, we have some kind of average percentage, but we also have more dispersion of what the reads could be because they came from these different individuals. Okay, that's where the negative binomial comes from. Okay. Now, when the expected counts are really high, uh, like over 100, which is not really that high these days, right? Um, then it turns out that if you could take the square root or log of the counts, um, you get something that's approximately normal and you could really just go ahead and use lemma. And that's another um, option that people sometimes do. And in fact, I think the lemma manual now has a section on the analysis of RNA-seq data. But the problem is it's only good for uh, highly expressing features. And most of us are interested in those low features. Um, and at least what I've noticed, my collaborators, um, once we could get enough, uh, once we had enough sequencing space to get nice high counts for genes, then all of a sudden they're interested in exons and things like, you know, smaller pieces. So, or they multiplex. So no matter how you look at it, mostly we're going to end up with a lot of 
genes having small counts in each sample. Yes? But also the logarithm of the count? Pardon me? Also the logarithm is normally distributed? Well, the logarithm, you have a little bit of a problem because you can't take the logarithm of zero and you always get zeros. But if you add a little bit, they're close. Actually, square root is better, but people aren't used to using square root because then you don't have interpretation in terms of fold changes. But the logarithms are, are fairly good. Uh, what I've shown here are square roots, and you can see that they're pretty, so here's 100. That really looks like a normal distribution, right? Um, but at the logarithm at 100, it's a, it's a little more skewed, so you probably need slightly bigger samples. But like I said, it's easier to interpret. So the negative binomial model says, okay, each sample has its own true percentage of this gene and a library size that, that we know. Um, and then we get, we get to observe NIJ reads for transcript I in the biological replicate I. And NIJ uh, is Poisson with the appropriate mean. Uh, the expected count is that. But we haven't accounted for biological variation yet. And what we get is that, okay, I, I'm talking in a different order than the slide is, so let me say it. Um, what we do is we say pi ij is, has a gamma distribution with this mean and this variance, and that gives us the log normal. And gamma distributions, a gamma distribution that looks like that, the histogram looks like this. So this is, this spread here are the different percentages that the different individuals will have in their sample, okay? Um, so they vary around. And so we actually find then that our counts are negative binomial with this mean and this variance. Um, and like I said, we know the ends, so what we're really most interested in is this part here that we don't know, or actually this part here, which is like the treatment percentage, right? The, overall, the samples in the treatment. Um, and the library size becomes this known constant that we subtract off. It's called the offset, okay? And that's one reason we don't care about our PKM, for example, because it would, the gene length would become part of the offset. Um, but in order to appropriately compute the um, variance, we actually need to uh, have the counts. So uh, we don't want to use our PKM. Um, let's see, what else can I say here? The other thing is when we do our normalization, um, between samples, what we do basically is we adjust, we get an effective sample size, sorry, an effective library size for each sample, um, and that becomes the offset instead of the true library size. Okay, this stuff, this part here is all going to be hidden from us. The software handles that. You don't even take logs with these data because the model says we need to take logs. You put in the counts, the software does the log and all that. Okay. And then what we're going to do is this is sometimes called a log linear model or sometimes called a generalized linear model. Um, since we're doing things on the log scale, we model this treatment percentage through our linear model. So X might be an indicator for two different treatments, or it might be some continuous variable like dose. Okay, and that's what we're going to put into our model, and then 
the software will just kind of take care of the distribution and getting the appropriate estimates for these distributions. Questions? Now everything runs a little slower than Lima, and that's because uh, the actual linear models is just a matrix multiply, and so if you remember back to your matrix algebra course, it's like something you do in one step. Um, these turn out to be nonlinear models, and you have to iterate, and so it's a bit slower. Um, but actually, over the past couple of years, they've done an incredible job of speeding it up, so it's, you hardly notice it except for, well, you will notice it when you do some runs. Okay, so once, you're, once the software's got to this point, everything looks just like uh, what you do for microarrays. And uh, just as before, we could have block variables uh, or batch variables that help us um, take out some of the noise uh, due to blocking or batch factors. And we usually just specify the model through the factors and blocking variables. So that's it. So the model doesn't actually depend on what the counts are. Um, and for this reason, we sometimes pre-filter to eliminate the features with very low total read counts, by which I mean you sum across all the samples and if you only have a few counts, you get rid of them. And the reason is this, the power of the statistical tests is very low um, when you have low counts. It's kind of like Fisher's exact tests. If you only have, you know, three possible things that can go into the table, then uh, you can't get a lot of power for determining, dis uh, determining differences. Um, so the power is messed up by very low uh, expressing genes. On the other hand, we can, ag if we have more samples or we sequence more deeply, we can bump up the power by getting more reads. Yes? So how do you know the zero counts Well, that's okay as long as it's, cons I'm going to talk about this in a minute, but as long as it's consistent that one treatment has all the zeros and the other treatment has all the high ones, that's a very interesting feature, right? It's very differentially expressed. It's off in that condition and on in that one. Um, and the model, these models can handle it. The problem is that it seems like in some tissues, some samples have zero counts for genes that in the same treatment are on in other individuals. That's more problematic because that does, those data cannot be negative binomial. That does not happen with ne negative binomial data. Yes? So when I did the, um, the last couple of slides of the multiple comparisons uh, talk, the FDR talk, um, I said that the magic number for RNA-seq data is seven, um, which basically I determined by working out power computations to see um, how many reads you had to have. If you only have one sample in each condition and you're doing a Fisher exact test, how many reads you have to have to get 0.05 significance. Um, but most of us like to round it off, so I use 10. Um, if you look at, say, the Edge R manual or the DEC manual, they have much higher numbers, but I think that, that uh, that's because people didn't do these computations. They just sort of did a rule of thumb. So 10, 10 reads over the entire experiment for this gene. Should if you have fewer than that, you can't use it. If you have more than that, you should be able to use it, although you'll still have low power, but, you know, if it's very differentially expressed so that all the reads are in one treatment and the other treatment has zero, you should be able to detect, you should be able to get a significant p-value. Yes? No, 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 I'm talking about one gene at a time. One gene at a time. So in all of these analyses, for better or for worse, um, the way we treat it is we do one gene at a time tests, and then we use false discovery rate to adjust. But if you're really interested in pathways or gene families and you're going to accumulate, then you just redefine your feature to be that thing. Yes? 
Okay, so if you're using uh, high expression genes, can you use RPKM? Well, it probably won't hurt you too much, but the lemma uh, assumptions of how the variance, okay, when the lemma does the variance shrinkage, it's assuming that those plots of the variance that you did in the lab are gonna look sort of like this, except a little more spread out. So they're supposed to look like that. And it's not clear to me that RPKM looked like that because there's uh, the negative binomial uh, variation and the uh, gene length variation are both gonna be kind of folded into this. So I'm not sure what will happen. And Oh, that's a good point. More than another, you can give them different weights. So what limit actually does if you want to do this is that it calculates the expression measures and then it assigns weights to them where lower expressed genes get lower weights, lower expression values get lower weights, higher express, expression values get higher weights. So it's, it's a subtle implementation of Entail, but it does help with, with, the, um, uh, with the distribution of all the that ends up shrinking. Oh. Well, thank you. You've obviously read that section carefully, whereas I just sort of went, oh, look at that, they're doing <laughs> Okay, any other questions? Oh, is that, okay. Okay. So here's this question thing about the zero counts. Um, so I think by this time, a lot of people have noticed this. You get um, tissues in which, under the same treatment, some individuals uh, just do not seem to express certain genes, and we don't know why. Um, Mark Reimers, who will be here at the end, told me last year that this is very prevalent in brain samples for some reason. Um, I don't know whether it's genotype differences or environmental differences or, you know, Maybe if you're good at math, you express this gene, and if you're not, you don't. I don't know. Um, but anyway, the, uh, this is a problem because these are not uh, negative binomially distributed. So, um, so some, some people are now trying to add this to the model. My attitude really is very ad hoc. You know, you go through, you look and you try to find these genes, and then I try to look at them separately after I've analyzed everything else because it's usually at most a few hundred. And I try to understand what they are um, rather than fuss over how they affect the whole analysis. Yes? You just fix the results before. Well, some people do. I usually just leave everything in because this software also does a variance shrinkage, and the way it does it is by shrinking the dispersion. So what happens is these genes have extremely high dispersion. And the variance dispersion just sort of knocks these down. And so what happens is they look more differentially expressed than they probably are, but they don't affect the rest of the analysis. Every, they don't affect all the other genes. So I just throw them all in, and then I look at them. I pull them out by looking at, you know, say the median counts for treatment and things like that. Okay. okay. I'm not aware of any software. I know that I just missed a uh, dissertation defense at Penn State with somebody dealing with this issue, and I know Mark's trying to deal with this issue, but I, um, the, the thing is, it's not clear to me that you want to like automate this. What, what you want to automate is pulling out these, getting a list of what these genes are. It's not, even if you know how to model them, I still think you don't want to automate and just throw all your data in and out, come out with a list of differentially expressed genes. And with the brain tissue, it's probably a good to have different cell types in whatever samples. And are they having very different expression in those samples? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe. But it's pretty, you know, I mean, other 
In other genes, you'll see variation, but these are off. So, um, so another problem we discussed this when we talked about false discovery rates is um, it's harder to do false discovery rate um, corrections when you have low expressing features. And again, uh, as far as I found, um, and one of my students did investigate this pretty thoroughly, the best thing that we found so far is just to get rid of these really low ones. Okay, so here's an example from um, the, here, okay, we looked at the difference between two samples, one sample split across lanes, so you don't expect much differential expression. Uh, all of these with p equals one, these are low expressing genes where the p values either a zero, a half, or one, that's all you can get. Um, and if you take out the ones that have very low counts, uh, then things flatten out, although you still get a peak. And if there's differential expression, as there is here, this is liver versus kidney um, in this same species. And here, uh, excuse me, you get, uh, you can definitely see the differential expression better when you take out the low ones. So I think we saw this slide in the FDR talk. Okay, so again, the models need to take into account biological variation, the uh, library size variation between the samples, and the extra Poisson variation. So, um, right now, the, there's actually several packages now in Bioconductor. Uh, it's always a lot of fun to try to figure out which one's the best one and so on. Um, but the two that are most used are EDGEAR and DEC-seq, and I just noticed that there's a new version of DEC-seq that is in parallel with the old one, so. Um, the analyses, the model is quite similar for DEC-seq and EDGEAR. What's different is how they handle the extra Poisson variation. And uh, right now, I think EDGEAR does the best job of normalization and uh, shrinkage. But these guys, it's a tight competition. You know, it's like these biology folks that are publishing every two weeks. I mean, they're, they're kind of leapfrogging each other. And um, I think either of these packages is fine. Uh, the reason I like EDGEAR right now is I think DEC kind of overdoes it. And you, usually the gene list you get from DEC is a subset of the gene list you get from EDGEAR. And it's hard to know whether those ones that are on one list or on the other are false positives or not, right? Um, but at least from EDGEAR, you get to see them. And anyway, so um, the data we're going to look at is uh, this Blackman and all uh, liver samples. There were two treatments, treatments, uh, gender and species. Everything was mapped to the human genome. Uh, so some of the differences are going to be mapping differences, right? But then the library side is the, is the total map read, so in a certain sense you have accounted for that already. Um, sort of, but it, you know. Anyway, um, there were, I, I guess I'm, I'm going sort of because presumably some reads will map better across species. I mean some genes will map better across species than others because they're closer homologs, right? Anyway. Uh, this is kind of an old data set, and I keep thinking maybe I should get rid of it, but it has some very unique features that make me want to keep it. So, um, so even though uh, in this world, as you know, 2010 is old, um, it, one feature is that each sample was split across two lanes to get enough reads, and the other feature you'll see shortly. Um, there's three biological reps of everything, uh, there's the features. Uh, they were pretty short. Uh, now we probably use 50, I guess, for this kind of study. Um, but the main reason, I have to, true confession, the main reason that I used this uh, in the first place was that 
there's a table of counts available on GEO, not just the raw data, and so I didn't have to go back and do all the map, all the uh, summaries myself. Okay. So these are the map, number of map reads. Oops. It was better, but now it's died. <laughs> so if I could have the other one back, that would be handy. I think it's right. Oh, what did I do? Oh, okay. Um, so this is the library size for each of the libraries before I added them up, sorry, for each lane. And you can see there's some fairly substantial differences. Um, and I guess one question when you see that is why is that? And I have seen uh, studies in which some lanes re uh, return 10 times or 20 times as many reads as other lanes. And then I often wonder about what the quality is, but I don't know what to do about that. Um, but this one's not too bad and it's kind of typical. Sorry, very large. Well, to me, it's not a statistical issue because, issue because you're going to get the offset, which takes into account the library size. But I would have to ask myself what happened during the sample processing and uh, sequencing that made this lane return such a small count compared to that lane. Yes. But still, you have a very large system, but it's not a problem either in well, it's, offsetting. It's a little bit of a problem because, in, in essence, these softwares use um, the geometric mean. Remember what the geometric mean is? You take the log, you average the log, and then you go back. So um, the effective library size over all the libraries is going to be pulled up or down by these aberrant libraries. Uh, but I don't think it has a huge effect. No. Unless the percentages in that sample are also quite aberrant. Would it be completely nonsense to just randomly reduce the size of random reads from the library? I would not pick random reads from the library to try to get it down to the other size because, like I said, what is most worrisome is the idea that there could be biases and if you randomly select reads, you're not going to reduce the biases. Mm -hmm. So I just either use it or don't use it. And one thing you can do if you have enough samples is you can do a sensitivity analysis and just take that aberrant sample out and see how much your, um, your gene list changes. Mm -hmm. Although, quite honestly, in high throughput studies, as you know, if you breathe too hard on your, on your numbers, the gene list changes. So um, people are looking at me funny. I don't know if you, it, for instance, if you've done microarray studies with exactly the same microarrays, even affymetric arrays, which are more precise, if you do RMA normalization or GCRMA, which is another one that's popular, or MAS5, your gene list can be very, very different. And that's with the same data. So, um, and that's what I meant by if you breathe too hard on your data, uh, you get different answers. Yes. Well, well, these are all good questions for which I don't have an answer. <laughs> um, basically, so what I always used to say in my Stats 100 classes, you know, we teach you to do one analysis as if this is the only experiment you're going to do in your whole life. Uh, but it's all, there were experiments that came before that made you want to do this experiment, and now there, and there's going to be experiments that come after. So I kind of see science as a self-adjusting system. Um, 
But if I say that too loosely, then you'll say, well, why do any statistics at all, right? Because whatever I do next will adjust. So let's just say these analyses should be nudging you in the right direction. And something that comes up, uh, no matter how you analyze the data, is something that has a really big effect, but it doesn't mean it's the only important effect that's out there. It may be that certain analyses emphasize certain kinds of effects better than others. Um, but of course, as scientists, uh, if we go after the low-hanging fruit, we have a better chance of success, right? Um, and hopefully once we understand the low-hanging stuff, the stuff that's higher up will be a little more accessible. Yes? Um, I would keep track of everything else. So I'd have this big gene, everything else, right? Actually, it would kind of mess up the analyses, mostly because of this dispersion shrinkage. So if it wasn't for that, I'd say, yeah, you could ignore everything else. Mm -hmm. But you can't really. But what you can do uh, is, if you, you know, you can combine some small number of features. And in fact, that's what we're really doing anyway. I mean, uh, well, the, the reads are coming from transcripts, and there might be splice variants, but when we convert them to gene-wise counts, we've combined all those splice variants. So that doesn't mess things up too much as long as we're not combining across too many things, and as long as we don't want to make inference about the individual members of the things that we combine together. But once you are combining, you know, a quarter of your gene space, then I think I'd start worrying about this model, which is meant for very small P pi ijs, for starters. Um, and also I'd worry about what I threw out. Um, and in fact, it brings us to the next topic, because one of the reasons I like this data set is it brings up this issue. So these are liver samples. And in these samples, this is the percentage of the sample made up by the most highly expressing gene. This is not a small pi ij. Small pi ij's are like 1% or less, actually usually like 0.1%. And you can see that in this sample here, one gene is taking up 16% uh, of our <coughs> sequencing space. Okay, you guys, half of you are MD, so what is this gene? Albumin. Yes, it's albumin. Um, so I don't know, I guess this is a very sick, resix monkey female. Is that right? That's when you get high albumin? You said what that? Uh, I'd say this is, is this a sick monkey? No, a sick monkey with a low albumin. A low albumin, okay, it's very healthy monkey. <laughs> <laughs> Extremely healthy. So one of the questions that you might ask, and this came up before when we were talking about microarrays, is whether everything else, sh okay, so let's compare this one to this one. So should everything else be really depressed in this animal compared to everybody else? Um, or should we just sort of knock this out and consider all the other expression levels as percentages of everything except albumin? And I don't know, I mean, that's a biology question. It's not a stats question, right? So I don't know the answer to that. But if you normalize, um, the normalization we're gonna use for this sample is a so-called robust normalization. So what it does is the most aberrant genes like albumin are not counted in the normalization. Uh, and so it assumes everything else should be equal, basically. And these, the, the situation for these samples is even worse than this. Um, I can't remember, I spent time last night on the uh, vignette, so I can't remember what I have in here. Um, okay, so in these samples, the nine most abundant transcripts count for 25% of the reads. And there's 20,000 things we're keeping track of. Um, 
So that's one reason I keep this. I, I think this is a quite unusual situation. I have not seen this in any other study that I've analyzed, all like six of them or whatever. Um, so I think it's unique to liver, and it might be unique to the study. I don't know. Anyway, it is a problem that we need to deal with, and we need to know some biology to know what it really means. Yeah, you can have overexpression of a gene. And the other thing that can happen, uh, actually, I haven't worked with the data yet, but there's a person at uh, Penn State who works with viral infected cells, and so she's doing sort, sort of like a, a metagenomics type stuff. And the virus takes up most of the gene space, right? So what's happening with everybody else? But I haven't looked at her data, so I don't know. OK. So the effective read totals should need to adjust for both the actual differences in library size and uh, for the fact that you might have some extremely high expressing aberrant genes. Now here they're not so aberrant. Most of the samples, these nine genes, take up most of the gene space. But nevertheless, compared to everything else, they're really high. And this Poisson negative binomial assumption really doesn't hold for these genes because that model only holds when the pi ijs are very small. And 10% is not very small. Um, but anyway, so we're going to use a normalization. And the very simplest method is to, take, is to take all your counts and sort them from smallest, which is always 0, to largest, and then pick some quantile, like 75th, and, and give an offset so that that's the same in every sample. The problem with that method is it doesn't uh, account for uh, two things. One is the aberrant ones at the very high end, and the other is um, the samples that have no reads for genes that other samples do have. Um, so instead, we're going to use the TMM method, which adjusts for outliers on both ends. And, and I'm not going to discuss TMM in any detail just because it's complicated. Um, but it does seem to do a good job, and you know, there's papers about it. It's, um, it's based on an MA plot, and you get rid of some outliers, and I'm not quite sure what all the details are. I'd have to go look. Okay. Um, for most, most of the time, what did I do? Most of the time, it actually seems to do about the same as this. And what it does is, it gives a multiplier for the effective um, for the effective library size. So the offset gets multiplied, and then of course you take log. So if you're adding another small constant. Okay. So that's normalization. Then the next thing is the dispersion shrinkage. Um, so this, uh, we've already seen this. I am having trouble with this thing. So for Poisson data, the variance is the same as the mean. Uh, but for the negative binomial, we get this instead. And um, the person, the, I, I think that the person who wrote Ed Jar came up with this first, because he's also the person that wrote Lima. And he was thinking in terms of this. But what he wanted was something that you could shrink that wouldn't depend on the library size, so it would scale properly. Um, and the dispersion turned out to be a good thing to do. And now and DEseq does this as well, but slightly differently. So the moderated methods shrink the dispersion towards a common value determined from the data. And the effect is similar to variance shrinkage, but it scales with library size. Okay. And here's an example. Um, so the, the, this comes from EDGE-R. Um, basically, it will, by default, there's a parameter that says how much it should shrink. OK? And here's, come on. OK. Here's very little shrinkage. Here's more shrinkage. And here's severe shrinkage. So. What you can see is the biggest effect is on 
these very over-dispersed genes. They have much higher variance than you'd expect. Um, and if you shrink a lot, you can get everything down to one dispersion value, which is called the common dispersion. And if you do that, what's going to happen? Well, dispersion is a multiplier of the variance or standard deviation, right? And so you'll, for all these genes that had high dispersion, you're going to estimate a much smaller uh, standard deviation than you should, and so they're going to come up as differentially expressed even if they're not, right? Now what about down here? This is where most of the action is. This pulls the low ones up a little bit. So these are things that have very small variances, and so they look like they're going to be differentially expressed because you always look at differences in standard deviations. And that gets pulled up a little bit. Um, okay, I'm better off just walking over. It gets pulled up a little bit. See, this got smaller and so on. So um, those genes will get a slightly bigger variance estimate. And actually, that's what you want because most of your false detections are there in those low expressing genes because you don't have enough power, basically. Um, so uh, EDGEAR uses this direct, uh, direct method that's based on this thing that's called, it used to be called prior N, and it looks like in the, in the documentation, uh, I wasn't sure whether it was prior N or prior DF. Uh, I couldn't figure that out, but the good thing is that R, as long as it's a unique string, we'll go with a unique string. So in the vignette, I just said prior. <laughs> okay. Anyway, DSeq does something very similar, except that the weird thing is it pulls the bottom up, but it doesn't pull the top down. And my observation, although I can't really validate it, is that what happens is up here you have some truly differential expressing genes, you've got a lot of power, you've got a lot of information, but DEC doesn't find them because uh, it's, it's using these enormous dispersions. Um, but again, you know, really biology should, te should tell you what's going on and I don't have, I don't know that enough. So, okay, questions about that? Okay. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to um, take a break and then reconvene in the lab and just go through the vignette. And in the vignette, you're going to look at this liver data. You're going to reproduce all the plots. It's, it's already in counts per gene. You're going to reproduce everything that was in the, vin in the talk as well as some other things. We'll do some clustering to see, um, you know, what clusters together. We'll do some tests to see whether the two lanes for the same sample are the same, are, are similar. Uh, we'll combine and so on. So that's what we'll do. And I'll see you over there in 20 minutes or so. <laughs> <laughs>